It is common knowledge that um, Africa is a continent with many um, hotspots of what? Political, economic, and social instability. So, good evening, uh, everyone, to this uh, truly earth shattering uh, event. Uh, it is the beginning of a five year long cooperation. Um, that is made possible by the Austrian Research Association. And uh, the General Secretary of that organization is with us, Katharina Kortappe. And uh, I'd like to cordially welcome you into our halls here at the Diplomatic Academy. Um, it's, uh, it's a research network on peaceful change. And it's going to proceed uh, through two stages in terms of, in terms of uh, discussing peaceful change. The first one will be to map orders in which peaceful change happens. So regional orders, Africa, Latin America, and so on and so forth. What are similarities? What are differences? Functional orders, trade, um, arms control, um, whatever you could think of, finance, um, how does peaceful change happen within those orders? And then once we're, we're done with that mapping, then uh, the outcome will not be one big monolithic world order, be that labeled liberal or illiberal or whatever, or post-liberal, uh, but a much, much more nuanced picture. So not just one big world order, but different partial orders that interact with one another. And then in the second part of, uh, of this research endeavor, um, we're going to look at mechanisms, agency, then how all of this ties together. <laughs> um, throughout this project, there will be um, a number of events. So there will be a lecture series here at the Diplomatic Academy. Um, there will be workshops. Uh, there will be discussion papers. Um, Adams has just written one for us. Uh, there will be a web page, obviously, um, and, and that should be up and running in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, we're also streaming the events uh, because there's quite some interest from the outside as well. Um, before I hand over, I just want to say a few things about this peaceful change because you may wonder what that actually is. Um, the terminology comes from international law, basically. And international lawyers, after the First World War, they thought quite hard about how to settle peace uh, disputes peacefully. And then they came up with this terminology of peaceful change. So peaceful change for them was to negotiate the end of a dispute, uh, perhaps to mediate, perhaps to resort to arbitration, or something like that. And uh, it didn't take too long, though, then the concept assumed a much, much broader meaning. And in order to get at that broader meaning, I'm going to read you a quote by John Foster Dulles. He uh, said it in 1930. Later on, obviously, about 20 years later on, he would become Secretary of State under Dwight Eisenhower. At, the, at, that, begin, at that time, he was, uh, uh, say, a normal career diplomat. So, quote, of course, non-aggression and sanctity of treaties are elements of peace, but they are by no means its totality. Peace must also take account of the fact that life is essentially dynamic, that change is inevitable, and that transformations are bound to occur violently unless there are provided ways of peaceful change. Any world system is doomed if it identifies peace and morality with the mere maintenance of the status quo. To do this is to breed, as we have read, the forces of revolution and revolt. Yeah? So note 1930. Yeah? So a few years thereafter, something really happened. Um, so in other words, the gist about this concept of peaceful change is that international politics never stays the same. It moves on. And that raises the question about how you can make it move on in a non-violent way, in a peaceful way, however this is defined. And um, when we look at regional orders, then uh, probably there are very, very different challenges. So challenges in Europe are probably quite different challenges in Africa, Latin America, uh, North America, um, Central Asia, and so on. 
and so forth. And I'm very excited that we are starting this now with a talk on peaceful change in Africa. And uh, our speaker for today is Professor Adams Bodomo. He is Professor of African Studies at the University of Vienna. And um, I'm not going to tell you now whatever list of publications. I count the publications from 2016 to 19. There were 16. That is quite, uh, that is quite a lot. That's an excellent record. Um, what I find uh, most amazing about him is uh, that he, coming from linguistics, so he works on linguistics, focus on African languages. Um, but he also does a lot of other things and does that very successfully. So he works in African diasporas, uh, works in African politics much more broadly, and uh, has, amongst other things, uh, an astute interest in the relations between Africa and China. Uh, so I'm not going to praise him now too much more, but he really is a, an intellectual with many, many different facets. So uh, please join me and welcome Adams. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, thanks to the Austrian Research Association, and thanks to the uh, Diplomatic Academy of Vienna uh, School of International Relations, and of course, thanks to my friend uh, Marcus for inviting me to come here and speak. This is not the first time. I've spoken in this, uh, in this first star. I've come here several times, so I'm happy. I'm, I feel like I'm at, I'm at home. So, um, I also want to thank all the distinguished guests and all of you for coming over to listen to me and, probably, and, pro and hopefully to interact on this topic. So uh, when Marcus, and also another thing, Marcus and I we're very lucky to be supervising a very intelligent graduate student here who's sitting there somewhere in the middle. Yeah. So we, we do things not only on this one, but other things. And so we're very, I mean, he's also probably lucky to have us, of course. <laughs> 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 yeah, so just to, just to get that personal touch going. Yeah. So, um, and also to congratulate Marcus for winning that important uh, research project that permits all of us to come here today and talk about things. So congratulations. Yeah. Um, as uh, the chairman has mentioned, my topic for today is peaceful change in Africa. It is common knowledge that um, Africa is a continent with many um, hotspots of what? Political, economic, and social instability. It's, this is a given, we know this, we hear this, we see this in the news, we, you know, it, it happens all around us. So, internal political conflict leading to the rise of rebel groups and religious terrorist groups are aspects of this instability. And we all know that there are many terrorist groups and rebel groups everywhere, you know, in Somalia, you know, Al-Shabaab in Nigeria, you know, uh, Boko Haram, and uh, in Uganda, the Lord's Resistance Army, all these are terrorist groups that go on in our continent. So this instability has often led to violent regime changes in the form of coup d'etat. However, in the midst of all this, there could exist processes of peaceful and orderly change that are sometimes overlooked. You know, uh, there's a lot of, you know, pessimism about Africa, but there are also some very interesting and optimistic things that come out of that continent. So while countries like um, Somalia, which has um, never known peace um, for decades, or, or countries like Uganda and Cameroon, which have never known political change at all in the last three decades, are instances of these hot spots that I mentioned, of conflict. But there are also countries like um, Ghana, my own country, Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, Kenya, and there are some Kenyan people here. And by the way, congratulations for, for winning that, for beating that record uh, right here in Vienna. So, they, you know, congratulations. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the marathon record in under two hours. So this was done here in Vienna. Um, so while countries like Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Africa have regularly had peaceful changes in their political system. Um, indeed, some countries like Ethiopia have negotiated peaceful changes and coexistence with their neighbors. So we're talking about change, peaceful change, not just only within countries, but also countries coming together and trying to coexist and, 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 and peacefully. So uh, this aspect of peaceful change has led to the winning of the 2019, this year's Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, by the Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abi Ahmed. But we may ask ourselves, what at all is peaceful change? What is peaceful change? Um, are there really instances of peaceful change in Africa? And if so, what are the mechanisms of, or processes of peaceful change on the continent? Just now, the chairman was mentioning, when we go back to the literature on peaceful change, the chairman was mentioning a few of them. I have a few of them here with me. Peaceful change, according to Owada 2007, is a multifaceted concept that refers to many diverse processes for bringing about change in international situations through peaceful means. It's kind of a secular, secular uh, argumentation. Yeah. In a broad sense, then, um, the concept can comprise any process of changing international legal and extra legal norms or some structures of the international system based on some no such norms without the use of force. So this is a, a clear definition in the literature on peaceful change. Now, according to our, uh, uh, Marcus, uh, our, own, our own chairman here, according to him, Contrast, uh, peaceful change has elements, three elements. One, restraint. Two, compromise. And three, polylog, which is a looser form of dialogue. Conflicts are always bound to be, are always to be expected, but they can stop short, I'm quoting him, but they can stop short of war by restraint. These conflicts can also be transformed through negotiations by meeting somewhere in the middle, that's compromise, and even by reasoning together about how to move forward all along. So all these three elements, restraint, compromise, and polylog, have been involved in many types of political movements in Africa that have led to uh, non-violent changes. So yes, there has been instances of peaceful change in Africa. So uh, I will focus on some of these things, these instances, these processes, process of peaceful change in Africa. Um, so there exist several processes or mechanisms that have led to peaceful socio-political, socio-economic, and socio-cultural changes in Africa. But uh, in the interest of time, the chairman has allotted me only 45 minutes. In the, in the interest of time, I will focus on two here. And I will focus on some interesting things. You know, for those of you who are from Africa, I see many of you here. Uh, in the 1990s, there was this wave of what is called national conferences, or in French, les conférences nationales. So uh, I'll focus on the idea of a national conference and the idea of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where South Africa comes to mind. These are the two things I'll focus on. Now, the national conference idea is not very different from when villages in Africa always had a problem and they met under the tree. In my own culture, in my own uh, part of uh, Ghana, 
we often have people doing this. Whenever there's a problem in the village, people come up and they sit. In fact, in my language, the word parliament is called under the tree. So, tie pare, tie, uh, tree, pare under, under the tree. Why? Because they would choose a very shady tree and then sit together and, and do restraints and do compromise and do pulling up. Three or three or three points. So this is what they do. So the concept of national conference is swept through most of the Francophone, so-called, I hate to call these Francophone countries because but they, that's what is, is the literature. Most of the Francophone countries, that is the former French speaking countries, had this kind of uh, incident, this kind of uh, process in an attempt to, uh, to change or to, to settle differences or conflict in the country. But let's go back to the literature and see what this means. As Helbron, 1993, and Nwajiaku, 1994, show between 1990 and 1997, there were as many as six conférences nationales, that's the national conferences, in former French colonies of Africa. Two of the most prominent of which are, were in Benin and Togo. These conferences were involved in bringing all the stakeholders of the country together to find a way out of national crisis and to draw up a constitution to pave the way for elections and peaceful transfer. I'll come back to this, talk about how successful this was. Um, but let me also introduce briefly the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and two names come up here, of course, uh, the man himself, uh, Nelson Mandela, and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is still alive. They are the two that uh, are coming prominently. Uh, it is a well-known mechanism in South Africa, in South Afri an African, general African history, actually, that has been used to achieve peaceful change in post-apartheid South Africa. It comes with a mix of indigenous methods of peaceful conflict resolution, all based on the philosophy of Bantu, uh, sorry, of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is, uh, you know, I am because of yeah, or something, like that. so you all know about this, the philosophy. Gade 213 has taken a critical look at this in regards to the idea of restorative justice. So the whole idea about the truth and the was to try to restore justice. So um, we'll see again, we'll come back it and see whether it has been successful. So besides these two major processes, there are many others, but let me be a little bit controversial this evening and, uh, and introduce something. Um, now, I would like to introduce the idea of meaningful, peaceful change and the idea of people power. Nobody should be afraid of this term. That's a very interesting term. So besides the two mechanisms of processes mentioned above, there are more turbulent, though not necessarily violent, mechanisms of change that I refer to as people power instigated change. The, the term people, people power occurs not just only in Africa, but it's also occurred in other parts of the world, with Philippines coming up. Very more, very more, and the Ferdinand Marcos, and many other things. The Philippines were, they were known, they poured onto the streets. And so for me, whenever I hear the term peaceful power, I think very much more to the Philippines. But it has also happened in Africa. So these are, so, um, these are often movements involving people spontaneously pouring onto the streets and demonstrating or getting involved in all kinds of acts of civil disobedience to press for political and social change. Examples of this in Africa have happened in North African, Maribian countries like Tunisia and Egypt at the turn of the millennium, what is often known as the Arab Spring, uh, and of course recently in Sudan. So this is very, very fresh in our minds. So in this kind of change, in this kind of change, it is this kind of change that I refer to as meaningful, peaceful change. And these demonstrations have often led to people sitting down at the table 
and discussing, you know, and I'm going to claim that the peaceful change that we're talking about, this the, the, power, the people power movement that we're talking about, they are also part of peaceful change. Uh, it is this kind of change that I refer to as meaningful peaceful change, and which I define as change that leads to real transfer of power from the elites to the masses, and which may engender a fairer sharing of the national cake. People power is instigated change could still be peaceful. I'm sorry, people power instigated change could still be peaceful in the sense that it could still involve, as I mentioned earlier, the elements of restraint so nicely uh, you know, outlined by uh, Marcus in his papers. Uh, of course, they involve restraint. Many of these are peaceful demonstrations. Many of these are peaceful demonstrations. When the masses stand out, they come out, they start a demonstration. It is rather the establishment that causes the violence, right? So they also involve compromise in the form of negotiated bargainings, right? And, and, uh, and they could also involve the third item uh, and uh, Marcus's thing, polylog. And uh, polylog because uh, we're not only just talking about dialogue, it is, we're talking about all the multiple voices demanding change in the streets. So um, it is however meaningful. It is however meaningful because the end result is more often that real power is transferred to the masses that are demanding change. So in comparison to, to the more traditional forms of peaceful change, such as the national conferences that I mentioned, of the former French colonies, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa, where peaceful transitions have occurred without real power changing from elites and fairer income distribution. People power movements um, have uh, often ended with more meaningful change. In fact, many of the, as I said, I will come back to evaluate the national conference idea. Many of the national conferences still ended with dictatorships as happened in Togo. Yeah, because uh, and the, in Benin, the, the national conferences ended with, with a peaceful transfer, I mean, transition from dictatorships to uh, regular democratic elections in Benin. And Benin today is still a very democratic country in terms of elections coming up and down and so on. Uh, presidents, they're losing, sitting presidents losing power and, and, and for the opposition. Like also happened in Ghana, in my country, and also in Nigeria. So this has happened. But in Togo, President Yasinbe simply manipulated the process. Because the idea of peace of uh, the national conference is that people, stakeholders are brought from all sections of the country. They, they have a conference, they negotiate, they write a document, and place it before the sitting president, who must accept this and allow a process to continue for change. So when it came to, when this process came to Nyasingbe Yadema's uh, 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 decks, he, he just simply ignored it and manipulated it. So the peaceful changes that we've seen, and, and other countries have had peaceful changes, the, the two Congos, Congo and the, the DRC, and also in Gabon, and also in, in Mali, and in many other places, about six of them. But some of them didn't succeed. You know, Gabon is still as it is. You know, so in terms of evaluation of these traditional systems, I would say that the people power movements are much better. I mean, Tunisia still continues to be uh, democratic. It was the result of people power movement. I'm not so sure about the e Egypt, but Sudan, in fact, it, it has resulted in better real change now because the people who are demonstrating, many of them are now serving in the government and a lot of women representation, female representation. So the people uh, power changes that often come up and with a better way of involving the masses. Of, because I mean, when you talk about change, I mean, the elites, people who have all the resources, they're not interested in change. Why should they change if they have all the resources? Why? So it is, the, it is when power, it is when people put pressure, like people power movement put pressure on them that you can begin to see real change. Um, in the case of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as I mentioned, Gade is a nice study that has had a very critical, uh, a very critical on the success of TRC 
that's true from the Creation Commission, in the sense that it has hardly achieved any kind of restorative justice. Just now, when I was introducing it, I talked about restorative justice. Just to restore the justice system. I mean, anybody sitting in this room, can you tell me that there's more justice now in South Africa than before? I mean, the people, most of the blacks still are, 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 don't feel that there has been change. And probably some of the, some of the events that occur with uh, blacks standing against uh, other blacks who are foreigners in the country, it's just because of this thing that they haven't seen any real change in their country since the end of the apartheid system. Of course, formally, of course, the apartheid system ended, but uh, practically, it's just not, it hasn't seen any changes. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was, it's good that they did it, the process, but it hasn't achieved all the successes that it should have achieved. Um, I'm normally a very, I don't like to talk long, so uh, since I don't want to go beyond the, the so let me conclude. I conclude this talk by reminding the audience that while Africa is often seen as a region of violent hotspots, there have also been many instances of peaceful socio-political changes in many parts of the continent. What should be more important is to look at who this peaceful change benefits. Um, if peaceful change results in power being in the hands of the political and economic elite, then the peaceful change is meaningless. We need to look at creating conditions for meaningful, peaceful change. And this involves change that results in a fairer sharing of the national cake. And I here give a good example of, you know, we're in Vienna. And uh, so when I came to this about six or seven years ago for a job talk, I, I didn't know anything about the Saha Torte, right? But my daughters called me from Hong Kong, but then I was in Hong Kong. One of them is sitting here. They called me from Hong Kong. I said, Daddy, you cannot come back to Hong Kong without Saha Torte. So I asked my, I asked my tour guide, what, what is Saha Torte? And he said, no, you, I mean, you don't mean today, that's the most famous cake in Vienna. So I'm using it as a symbol. So I bought that Saha Torte with me uh, on my, on, uh, to go back. But uh, I'm using it as a symbolic thing to share that. Hey, I, we must share the national cake equitably. If you don't share the cake, there will never be peaceful change in any country. The, other, the last point I want to make is that peaceful change can only be sustained in Africa if external powers desist from exploitative and imperialistic engagements with African politics and all African politics. Um, peaceful change in Africa and in other parts of the world can only come about if we endeavor to develop a fairer and more symmetrical world order, politically, economically, and culturally. Uh, let me end with, uh, with my favorite. This is a wonderful uh, uh, photo that has been circulating in social media, uh, you know, Facebook, and showing how beautiful our continent is. So we must all work together. And this, be this beautiful continent is not just I mean, we should all enjoy it, not just only African, but other parts of other, other people can also go and enjoy it. So let's work hard to maintain peaceful change and to make sure that there's meaningful peaceful change on the continent so that we can all enjoy the wonderful uh, things that we see about Africa. Thank you very much.